Welcome back to another Conversations with Chess Leadership. I'm Chess President Dave Shulman. I met with, uh, I'm having the pleasure of meeting with Dr. Gabe Boslett. Uh, so thanks for joining us, yeah, Dave. Yeah, good to see We've you. We've known each other a long time, but for the, in uh, for the interest of those who don't know you as well as I do, tell us a little bit about Gabe Boslett. Yeah, so I am a program director at Indiana University. I have been there since essentially 2010. Um, I'm also an assistant dean of faculty affairs and professional development there. And I've been affiliated with Chess since Oh man, probably 2008 uh, when I joined as a fellow member of the Training and Transitions Network. Back before it was a committee. Before it was a committee. That's right. That, that tells us a little bit about your age. That That's it, it unfortunate. My hair does too. So, um, as is yours. Yes. <laughs> don't rub it. We don't need to. You don't discuss hairlines on, on this show. That's one of the rules. Um, talk a little bit. One of the things that we want our membership to get a better sense of is opportunities to get involved. So can you talk a little bit, so you joined, uh, you, it was, did you have to run for the position at Training and Training? Like how, does, how did that work back then? I did. What's your I, journey looked like since I, then? I had to self-nominate, my. I had to nominate myself. Um, I knew it came about because Jack Buckley, who was my um, program director at the time, said, hey, this is available if anyone wants to put their names in. I did, I'm not sure if anyone else, I may have been the only person to put my <laughs> name in. Um, Cause I think it was one of the first years that they were doing it. And I got it, and um, I was affiliated with Training Transitions for ten over ten years uh, after that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, to me, getting involved means the way you get involved is you just raise your hand for something. It may not be something like a committee. It may be something like you know grading posters or uh, grading abstracts or anything like that, and just. I tell our fellows all the time, like academics is two things. The first thing is you raise your hand to do something. The second thing is you do it really well. Most people do the first and don't do the second. And so, um, yeah, just raise your hand for something and do it well and do it with a smile and keep doing that. And that's the way it works. You have a great, I want to circle back around to this, but I'll give you a hint because you'll, you'll know what I'm referencing is uh, you're active on Twitter. We'll talk about social media in a bit. But one of the pinned tweets you have is this sort of decision making piece in academics. I want to come back to that, okay. but you know where I'm going to head with okay. that. Um, maybe briefly, what is the Training and Transitions Committee? So you chaired it in, in past years. Yeah. You're now sort of out of the leadership of TNT. What does the committee do? The committee basically represents the needs and uh, it advocates for trainees within CHEST. So we make sure that there's a lot of content for fellows, residents who may be interested in pulmonary critical care, medical students as well within the on the website at the meeting um, our job is to constantly have the learners in mind when we think about kind of the things that chest is doing um, and yeah that's been i consider training and transitions the best committee at chest uh, if you look at actually the leadership here this week for the 2022 program it's a lot of people that have come through tnt yeah. So again, I, I can't be biased in my current role <laughs> off the record because no one's really listening. Yeah, I, I will say that the most fun I think I've had, with maybe the exception of being program chair, is my work with TNT. Yes. Now, one of TNT's sort of branded products is Chess Challenge. When people think of TNT, that's often the first thing. Without spoiling any secrets, because there's sometimes there's a little bit of wonder, of, of the wonder, and we don't want to look behind the curtain too much. Talk a little bit about how Chess Challenge comes to be. Not necessarily the competition side, but like the creation side, the, the, the big show that we do at the meeting. Yeah, there's a lot of work that goes on to create Chess Challenge by the Training Transitions Committee. Um, really, I mean, the, the template is there, right? I mean, Bill Kelly created the template of Chess Challenge, and that hasn't it That pretty much stays the same, but TNT is constantly, first of all, creating the game board. So creating questions that we haven't seen in Chess Challenge before, et cetera. That's a lot of work. Making sure that uh, the final Jeopardy question is good, appropriately difficult, that it, you know. Not too hard. Not, not like too no hard. Get, but not but also gimme. That's right. And then also innovating. I mean, every year we try to throw in something new, a new sim. Uh, you know, the last couple of years, virtual has been a challenge, but I think we've weathered it pretty well. And so a lot of it is just. Um, 
curating what works well within Chess Challenge and then trying to innovate on the edges to kind of make it new every year. So I'll ask one in each. So what's the biggest hit? What's the one thing that you've done as a component of Chess Challenge? Let's stick with that because, again, it's, the, it's that you're like, that is the like the best experience. Like we gave our audience what they wanted. I, I can think of one or two things, but is there any one thing you're like, I'm so proud that I was a part of the team that did that? Um, when I was chair of TNT, we started the, um, the live simulation uh, challenges for the teams and that that I remember uh, the first year that happened and that was the, it was in a kind of a room that was a little too small for chess challenge which is perfect because it creates a lot of energy and uh, it was just uh, it, it went off really well, and the whole the whole evening was pretty electric. Actually, was that the year uh, that there was the guy in the audience? Yes. Okay. The the planted the, uh, shirtless guy. So what, what, yeah. So so we you had or somebody had I don't. Remember they who's. asked they asked for a volunteer for an ultrasound sim, and uh, this <laughs> this plant <laughs> raised his hand and stood up and just ripped his shirt off. And he was and built. Was, this is a, yeah, yeah. Not was did not look like me at all. My recollection is we had somebody who wasn't planted who also tried to volunteer that is correct. for the role. I forget said, who it was, but I don't, yes. It's a, it's a wonderful story. Um, one of the challenges, no pun intended, as we transition, is in, in getting involved is people... TNT is a competitive committee. I mean, many of the ch committees at Chester are competitive <laughs> to, to get on. What do you say to folks who run... Because you, at least when you were on the committee, you were part of that sort of... We got you know, dozens of applicants sometimes for two or three positions. Not everybody gets there the first year, second year. How, how do you motivate people? How do you inspire people to continue to try when it becomes a little frustrating sometimes to not, we always always like to get what we want. When we don't get it that first time, what what can people try to do? I mean, it's, it's I'll put even a finer point on it. Most people don't get it the first time. I mean, it, it's just the, the way the numbers work. There are just a ton of people applying for these positions. And so it is frustrating. It's very frustrating. Um, you know, and and part of the process is being resilient and and going back. So I would say two things. First, on TNT, we've tried pretty hard to um, get the people engaged who nominated, self-nominated, and didn't get it in other ways. So we make sure they're on lists to to grade case reports, to do to do other things for the committee, so that they can remain involved. And so I would say. Um, don't expect to get it on the first try or maybe even the second. Um, we take applications every year. Um, when um, you don't, it's, you know, don't hang your head in Charlie Brown style and walk away. Just sort of raise your hand and say, okay, I didn't get it. What can I do to help the committee? Um, because what you want is your name to be on stuff, right? Oh, so-and-so graded these things and did a great job, right? I mean, that's the, that we're looking for people who have good ideas, but also, frankly, there's a lot of work to be done on TNT. And so we wanna make sure the people that, that are on the committee are willing to do that work. So raise your hand to, to do some things and to, and to participate in a way, in the way that you can. And there will be opportunities to, if you've put your name in, and just do it well, and eventually it'll happen. Yeah. Persistence is, I mean, yes. they, they, people see our successes, they don't see the, again, the, the joke is That's for me, exactly eight right. times I ran for the education committee and was yep. not selected. That's so, exactly right. um, in terms of doing things, so getting involved is important. There, meeting people is important. Uh, I want to get back to the the pin tweet on Twitter, and we'll transition into social media. So, one of you have an outstanding library of content on social media. One of the things that I reference often, and I turn other people to, is the sort of academic decision making template. Should I? Is this because you know in academics, even outside of academics, constantly things, opportunities to do things show up, mm -hmm. and you you have to sort of. Idea is this something I should do? Can mm -hmm. you sort of walk us through a little bit about the mindset, the counsel that you offer people who are thinking about, is this something that I should engage in? Yeah, so that that's my pinned tweet um, and will always be my pinned tweet. And so that came about when um, one of my junior faculty members who was a fellow mentee had an opportunity to do something that came into my office and said, hey, someone asked me to do this. What do you think about this? And I was like, well, what is your thought process about it? And we talked about it a bit, and I was like, wow, you know, this is really pretty algorithmic, the way that you should approach this really every time. And I kind of sat down and white chalk talked it out for her. And we talked about it, and I was like, you know, I want to put this down in a document. And, and so I did. And so 
the first question is, can you say no? Is this something, in other words, if my division chief comes to me and says, Gabe, I need you to be in this committee, in my brain, I'm, in my, I'm, I'm making the calculation, can I say no to Roberto right now? Or is this something where this is, I'm being voluntold? So the first question is, can you say no? The second question is, um, and I'm gonna mess this up because I haven't looked at it in quite a while. Um, the second question is, um, is this something that um, is on a waypoint to your destination, right? Is this something that is gonna serve your career or is this just kind of busy work that is gonna distract you from really where you see the prize, your career prize down the road? Um, and then the, the, there's another one in there that's something like, are these good people to work with, right? It's fun. Well, is it, it, it going to be fun, right? So maybe it's not on the waypoint of my career, but it's people I really like to work with who are really productive, who I know I can be, you know, give this really small part to this thing that they're trying to do. And so, um, yeah, I put that together. I, I put it up on Twitter. It was... Um, Peer reviewed, frankly, on Twitter, I is probably get you feedback more aggressively peer reviewed yeah. than most papers that I've published, um, because people are like, well, why isn't this in there, and why isn't this in there, and so it went through like three or four different iterations to get where it is now. I think it's version seven now, <laughs> um, and so yeah, I still get that that piece, still get. I mean, I wrote it three or four years ago, and it still will go in these. T times where it just gets shared a bunch People again, all over. It, it will be yeah. re reborn again and and reshared. So it's that's been cool. Yeah. Um, the last. So thank you. You've been very generous both with your time and with your thoughts. The, the last piece I want to transition to again is now from this into social media. So you have a very active presence on social media. Maybe more so now in the context of the pandemic than you did before. Although you were active even previously. Talk a little bit about. Um, the good and the bad of social media for an academic physician. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm I'm very biased. I mean, you know, I'm on mostly on Twitter. I have an Instagram account. I have a Facebook account that I I, I hardly use Facebook except for one uh, COVID thing that I do for Facebook. Um, I I very rarely use Instagram. Twitter is my is my jam, and the reason that Twitter is my jam is because it's it's a word based uh, social media, right? Instagram is mostly pictures. Right. But Twitter is, in my opinion, the marketplace of ideas. You have 280 characters to express something that may or may not be interesting, and you put it out there and see what happens. And to me, that's a, it's, um, it's my perfect medium, um, to the point where I now think in tweets, uh, usually when I'm brushing Real, my teeth. Really? Yes, I do. Okay. I will that's, be a brushing little, my, that's a little odd. I'm surprised it to is hear that. Odd. That's and a little... So that's part of the... So you asked for the good and the bad. So the good is... Um, I learn more from Twitter than anywhere else now. Um, you know, when a, a new paper comes out, I know about it before people who aren't on Twitter because the paper's released by the journal generally, and then there's usually a commentary by someone about the paper that comes out relatively quickly after that. That usually is pretty thoughtful. Um, and so I've not only know that the paper is out, but I've usually read not only the paper, but some commentary on it before people even know that it exists. And that's all because of Twitter. So from my perspective, it's wonderful for medical education and for, for uh, physicians in general because it's really where information is shared first and fastest. And, and you see that now in society, right? I mean, the first place I go is Twitter when, I, when something's happened. Like the Cerner's down. The first thing I do is open Twitter to see what's going on with Cerner. Does Cerner ever go down? No, almost never in my <laughs> institution. Um, so, um, so that's the good. The bad is that you have to be on Twitter in order to be good at Twitter. And you have to be on it pretty frequently, right? The fact that I now think in tweets is a pathology that I've cultivated inadvertently over the last five years. Um, and it's because I'm on there a lot, too much, frankly. And so I, you know, the balance is, is being on enough that you are fresh, but not enough that it takes over your in real life life. You have done more so, you've taught me many things. You and I, again, known each other a long time, but you've taught me many things. And one of the things you do incredibly well is you do um, compartmentalize. Meaning a guy who is a great academic physician, a lot of volunteer leadership experience here, APCC, MPD, the Program Director Association, family, uh, social media, you definitely do turn, you say I'm on too much, but you are very good at turning it off. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that not a lot of people do particularly well. Yeah, that, uh, you know, like most things was born out of necessity. I mean, if, if I'm honest about why that's the case, that happened in 2016 when I had a friend commit suicide, a physician friend. 
who was a frankly a mentor. Um, and it made me start to take a look at the way that I was doing things and I wasn't, <laughs> I was academically successful, but I was very unhappy. Um, and so I s took a hard look at the way I do things. So I don't check email after five o'clock as for the most part, I don't check email on the weekends. I don't tend to do work on the weekends. Um, unless I have a deadline that's coming up, it's the 80% rule that I use. I do it 80% of the time. Um, and I'm pretty strict about that. Um, because, you know, the thing that that event made me realize was that we get one turn on this giant ball and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm 44 years old once. Uh, you know, I, I don't wanna look back when I'm 82 and, you know, lying on my deathbed with my family around me and, and wish I had done things differently. So, yeah, that was born out of necessity and it's about as though it's been a great change, so. Um, last topic, I promise. Um, Part of what I have seen, and again, I follow you on Twitter, as do tens of thousands of other people, which is just cool to think about. Um, one of the places you've gotten into over the last year or so, again, probably as a necessity for the pandemic, is a little bit in the public and, and political advocacy space. Can you talk a little bit about that transition? Is it a place that you would encourage more doctors to weigh in? Yeah, uh, it is. Um, I think that we suffer from um, not enough of us in the political sphere. Um, I never, that's something that came about, um, you know, politics came to us, right? During the pandemic, we didn't, I, I didn't seek out politics. I was always interested in politics and advocacy, but it, it was shoved in our faces as, as SARS-CoV-2 has done what it's done. And so um, I'm someone who can't just sit and let things happen that are ridiculous. I, I have to, speak up about them and, and help be part of a positive change. And so for me, a lot of it has been advocacy on social media and not only on social media, but on, you know, traditional media. And um, even so far as going to my Indiana state house and testifying about a bill. Um, and that's become important to me. Um, that aspect of my life um, of being outspoken about the way that, um, we carry out the social contract with one another um, as humans together trying to live in a society has become, I'll be honest, a, a major focus of um, the things that I think about and that I tweet about every day. If you look at the, if you qualitatively look at the evolution of my Twitter account, it started out with medicine and medical education, then it went to the pandemic and now it's politics. Um, for better or for worse, but that's where life has taken me and so that's where I'll go. In this same space, I, I have appreciated one of the challenges of social media and politics maybe more so as any, is the, is the um, I'm trying to think of a word that isn't, is the extremity of it. Meaning more so now than ever, there's a divisiveness that has arisen in politics, the public sphere. And one of the things that you've tweeted about over the last couple of weeks that I really, is the thing I think about, but I'm loath to put out there, just is you have commented about the sort of demonization of the other side, that there are people who post opinions and they are just, yeah, because it's, it's, medicine is nuanced, m maybe more so than almost any other field. Politics has lost a lot of that nuance, and you have talked about the fact that you have seen people who offer opinions that may be a little different from the main, for sort of whatever the current expedient opinion is, who really get attacked on there. I don't know if you think uh, if you know the things I'm referencing. I do. Yeah, I, I definitely do. And and so it yeah, that drives me crazy. So polarization and absolutist um, rhetoric especially for something like the pandemic which I'm convinced has no right answers isn't helpful. And and so, you know, demonizing someone who says, you know, I think that we should remove masks in schools for example, which to me is within the Overton window of discussion about what's reasonable at this point is fine. But those people get shellacked yeah. on social media. It's ridiculous. And this is, that's, it's sort of, that's sort of baked into social media, right? Because the things that get likes and retweets are, tend to be absolutist language and not nuanced language. It's also hard to put nuanced language into 280 characters. 
Um, and so a lot of the messaging that I have is to be humble and to give grace to those who have opinions that may differ from yours. And that, that, that extends to the political sphere as well, right? I mean, there's a lot of structural issues with the way that we, um, that the way that our political system is set up that encourages polarization and that drives me crazy. Um, you know, the structure, the way that we elect people should be representative of the people in the state in which they reside and not so gerrymandered so that there is, uh, it's impossible for, for a centrist candidate to be a, a, a viable candidate. It drives me crazy. So yes, I, I'm very much a, 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 a proponent of allowing reasonable other opinions even when they seem very opposite to yours. Um, we'll, we'll end there. I, um, thank you so much, Gabe. So again, I've known you a long time. I don't know that we've had a serious conversation like this, and we should do it more often, even without the cameras present, sort of doing it for uh, the public sphere. But um, I, you know, you have always been inspirational in many ways to me. We've worked together a long time, but I really appreciate everything you've done, both for chess, for medicine, and for the public discussion. Thank so, you, David. It's been wonderful. Appreciate it. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks. And thanks for joining us.